but if we really want to do more, uh, we've talked about this idea of doing our own fundraising, for example. The, the act that creates this program allows us, the Fish and Wildlife Service, to accept donations from outside. So why, why, why can't we compete with ABC or TNC for, the, for, for, for dollars? I, maybe we can, and we're exploring that issue. Um, I, I was glad to see in Jeff's presentation the reference to our our uh, our census data. You know, the Fish and Wildlife Service has been doing a hunting, fishing, and wildlife uh, associated recreation uh, census every five years. Um, there's some great ammunition for those of us Washington types who need that ammunition to support and justify what what we do. Um, it, it so happens that, it, and maybe you know this, but in the 2001 survey, there was an addendum published which looked even more specifically at how much, how many people and how much money uh, is involved in bird watching. That survey, that census, that addendum has been repeated, and it's not published yet, but it will be, I think, I understood by, by the end of the year. So we will have some fresh data for you. I was able to peek uh, at some of those numbers, and uh, I believe the number of bird watchers alone. This is not including uh, people who feed birds at be uh, bird feeders at their homes, but those who actually go out and look and identify birds. Uh, the estimate is 48 million for the U.S. Um, of course. As in past surveys, uh, tens of billions spent on equipment, travel, uh, for, for bird watching. Uh, last, I didn't see an employment uh, number, but I think the, the 2001 addendum had close to a million people employed because of bird watching. Right, so this, this stuff is important uh, when you're talking to people who really don't care about birds, but may be in a position to, to do something. Uh, Congress persons, uh, corporate people. Why should we support this? Well, this is a major industry that we're involved in, besides the fact that we, we love the birds. Okay, so that's the funding issue. Um, what other, where else should this program be looking looking at in the future and specifically how how can a grants program address them certainly there are emerging threats and opportunities that we need to capture we need to be flexible uh, in this business if you're a football fan I, th I think we need to be the option quarterback sorry if you're not a football fan but you know that he drops back he can uh, he, he reads the defense he can throw a pass he can hand off he can keep the ball He's flexible. We need to be flexible as well. Um, I won't say much more about climate change because uh, I think uh, Lynn uh, Scarlett uh, covered it uh, extraordinarily well, giving you up-to-date research information. I simply want to say, okay, for us, very specifically in a grants program, what does this mean? And I, we'd be interested in your comments here as well. Uh, uh, what kind of proposals to address this issue could we entertain? Well, obviously we can't do, uh, Captain has pioneered this effort with, with things like uh, Shade One Coffee and bananas. Uh, that is to say, have a plantation agriculture example, some kind uh, you engage with them to see what, how can we work with the people uh, instead of automatically opposing them. That may be an appropriate response in some cases, but um, you already know about bananas and coffee and cacao. We, we've worked in those kind of things. Uh, American Bird Conservancy has pioneered the concept of living fences, uh, or promoted this concept. It's an old concept, which is going back. Uh, you have a, a, a large cattle ranch in Central America where the fence consists of fence posts and, and barbed wire. You look over the landscape, there's no trees, there's, no, there's nothing but grass. Uh, contrast that with what they've been doing in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Colombia, which is promote the development of living fences which have benefits to the landowner in terms of cost, in terms of shade for their uh, their cattle. Uh, Win-win situation. Okay, another, another example. 
Some things that are coming on strong and were not of much concern a few years ago, uh, palm oil uh, becoming a big issue in Central America and Colombia and the lowlands, and also soy, uh, especially in the southern cone of South America. Both of these uh, have organizations which our partners are trying to engage with. They are called the, if I have this right, the Roundtable, uh, for example, Roundtable of Sustainable Soy. Okay, whether they're, this is a good thing or not, I don't know, but our local partners are engaged with them, and we think this is a good thing. Uh, we need, every time a new threat or opportunity comes up, we've got to think about who our natural allies are. It so happens, for example, I, I have a lot of allergies, and I know that from reading the literature that soy is one of the top three allergens that, that's out there. I know from reading the literature that of the, some palm oil is used for human consumption. The literature tells me that palm oil is the least healthy of all the oils that are, that are out there. These are natural allies, perhaps, for us. Okay, how are we doing here? So far, so good. Just a couple more quick things about emerging opportunities and challenges, uh, the, the issue of physical obstacles, building collisions, uh, tower collisions, uh, uh, wind farm development. You've heard presentations here at this forum, I think, about some of those impacts. Uh, we see a role for us in terms of assisting with research to document uh, what, what the impacts are and how those impacts can be mitigated. Again, uh, cell phone towers by themselves in certain places and under certain meteorological conditions can create a problem, uh, but that those problems may be mitigated by new information we have concerning uh, the color of the lighting on the tower, the sequence of flashing uh, of, of, those, uh, of those lights, et cetera. Um, so again, uh, we, we heard, heard a lot about coal. Uh, we have funded uh, land protection through the Nature Conservancy in the heart of cerulean warbler breeding nesting habitat in eastern, eastern mountains of, of Tennessee. So we are thinking about, you know, directly how can our little program address some of these emerging uh, uh, problems. Finally, just to say, um, you know, are, are, there, are there different kinds of priorities that this program should address? Right now, we, we're pretty much dependent upon what comes in and, and selecting the best, the best proposal. We've got a, it's a, it's a tremendous level of competition. Um, are there geographic priorities, for example, that we're not, we're, we're missing? Uh, are there, is there strategic planning that uh, we need to do here and we actually have been through this a couple of times and and have not made frankly a whole lot of progress uh, what I will tell you though is this um, each of the bird conservation initiatives is essentially a plan and has planning objectives and in many cases uh, let's take the Western Hemisphere shorebird reserve network we have some very specific sites where we know we know are important in in a hemisphere that has shorebirds in it, we can tell you pretty, pretty carefully, okay, if, if, you're, if you're not doing something in Delaware Bay for red knots, so you're really not getting to the heart of it, okay? 